our issues, our voices, our views. This is Politics in Black. What's going on, Los Angeles? So, we got new faces for you today. Uh, it's been like a whole month since we have been with each other, and so we are so super excited. We have uh, someone we've been trying to get for a while. We have uh, Dr. Tommy J. Curry, but as you can see across from me today, we have Brother Marcus Champion hanging in here today, What's filling on, in y'all? for Brother Chad. Chad What's is taking a little bit of a break, so we got guest hosts. We The show don't stop. The show keeps going. Um, so we look, we really we booked a whole hour with Dr. Curry. So I think we are just going to get to it um, because we're reparationists. I can't just let the moment, though, go by without saying that uh, H.R. 40 has moved to the next level as far as bills go. It's out of the full judiciary now going in front of Congress. Uh, we are still pushing our fix H.R. 40 campaign, um, meeting with legislators, trying to get them to understand Uh, three fixes that we really want to put into uh, the bill to give it some teeth. Um, But we do want to acknowledge that the calls and and all of the emails that people sent out, uh, those things do matter. So thank you so much. Um, And so let's get to it. I'm ready to talk to Dr. Curry. So we're going to bring in Dr. Curry. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about Dr. Curry. So hold on. We've got got a lot to talk about here. But Tommy J. Curry joined the philosophy department at the University of Edinburgh in the fall of 2019. His research interests are in Africana philosophy and black radical tradition. His areas of specialization are 19th century ethnology, critical race theory, social political theory, and black male studies. He is the author of The Man Not, Race, Class, Genre, and the Dilemmas of Black Manhood, which won the 2018 American Book Award. He is the author of Another White Man's Burden, Josiah Royce's Quest for a Philosophy of Racial Empire, and has republished the forgotten philosophical works of William Ferris as the Philosophical Treaties of William H. Ferris, Selected Readings from the African Abroad, or His Evolution in Western Civilization. He is also the editor of the first book series dedicated to the study of black males entitled Black Male Studies, a series exploring the paradoxes of racially subjugated males on Temple University Press, Dr. Curry is currently co-editing the for, uh, forthcoming anthology Contemporary African American Philosophy, Where Do We Go From Here on Bloomsbury Publishing. His research has been recognized by, by diverse as placing him among the top 15 emerging scholars in the United States in 2018, and his public intellectual work earned him the Society of Advancement of American Philosophy's Alan Locke Award in 2017. He is a past recipient of the USC Shoah Foundation and AI and Manet Sheps Foundation Teaching Fellowship and the past president of Philosophy Born of Struggle, one of the oldest black philosophy organizations in the United States. With all those great things said, I am highly honored to welcome in Dr. Tommy J. Curry. Welcome, sir. And Dr. Curry, I have to say, like, we never read anybody's full bio, but in in tribute to you almost today, it's almost like we had to do it because, like, your body of works are so important, and I wanted to make sure we got the titles out. So welcome. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Um, we, you know, we, we call this a discussion on anti-black misandry. Can you mm-hmm. define for our audience, because that's a dictionary word. You got to go pull out an old school dictionary <laughs> to find out what that means. Can you tell our audience what that means? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, anti-black misandry is the cumulus stereotypes, uh, the negations or stigmas around black men and boys. Uh, that negates their personhood and justifies sanctions against them, sometimes lethal, um, that try to remove them from society or exterminate them altogether. Uh, And we see anti-Black misandry as a specific component of anti-Black racism. So a lot of the research that's going on now in social psychology, uh, by Black male studies scholars, uh, by people like William A. Smith, is around the idea of uh, racial misandry or misandric aggressions. And what that means is how certain racist stereotypes are driven by the ideas of savagery that black men and boys have. So uh, the idea that black people are more violent or criminal, uh, these these stereotypes involve 
uh, black men and boys. It's it's white people thinking that black men and boys are more criminal, or the idea that uh, blacks are sexual threats and promiscuous. It's the idea of the black male rapist that generates these ideas. So these these things are very important to understand that when we're talking about anti-black misandry, we're talking about the specific aversion and antipathies that whites and even other blacks have towards black men and boys. It's that hatred. It's those negative views or stereotypes and stigmas that you have towards uh, racialized males. Well, America has certainly been a master teacher at misandry. I will say that. Absolutely. And Dr. Curry, you know, it's one thing I found. I was reading uh, your paper, Killing Boogeyman, and I was watching a couple of your lectures, and you talk about how mm. black men just can't win, you know, on either side. You know, we're faced with this mm. stigma within, black fem uh, within feminism, black feminism, as well as white supremacy. And I just want to read an excerpt real quick from Killing Boogeyman. You said... While other subjects have been afforded the ability to speak individually as members of oppressed or marginalized groups, black men are censored, told that any mention of their oppression, vulnerability, or death is patriarchal. Because, it's inappropriate, because it inappropriately center, centers their experience over women's oppression writ large and thereby not worthy of more intellectual concerns or research. So I've just been getting that we're, we're in a no-win situation. On the black feminist side, Absolutely. it's kind of seen that if we fight our oppression in any way, we're seen as trying to achieve white patriarchy, but then on the white supremacist side, mm -hmm. if we fight our oppression, we're seen as aggressive, violent black men. So can you just speak on that a little bit? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you, you said it perfectly. I think academic black feminism puts black men in a catch-22, where any articulation mm -hmm. of our oppression is seen as a zero-sum game with black women's oppression. Now, this is absolute nonsense. There's never been a period of time in the world where black people, for example, are fighting about who gets more attention when they're dead. Uh, but this is the politics that we see right now. We see that with Say Your Name. We see that with arguments over whose picture gets put on National Geographic. Uh, is it George Floyd or Breonna Taylor's? And what we, what we fail to do is look at the concrete realities of black male oppression. The reality of the situation is that while police homicide and police shootings are a hot topic in the United States, um, amongst blacks, black men comprise over 96% of the victims. So if we're looking at this from any kind of public health standpoint, mm -hmm. we're, we're saying how is it that 96% of the victims of any specific kind of violence or crisis um, is being told that they should be silent. Now, the counter argument to that, I think, by black feminism is like, well, this erases black women. But that's not the issue. The issue is that when you have a population that disproportionately suffers a particular harm, right, that you attend to that population. Right. Women, for instance, are 98, 99 percent of people that suffer from breast cancer. Just because men suffer from breast cancer at one to two percent and it's more virulent. Right. We know most men who get breast cancer actually have worse outcomes. It doesn't mean that the resources should be dedicated to the two, one or two percent. When black men try to situate their their ills, their harms, their vulnerabilities, um, they're told that it's actually detrimental to our understanding, our study of, of other groups like women or, or black queer populations or even black trans populations. And it's that kind of zero-sum logic that makes black men feel as if they always have to be silent. Uh, this trend is so bad that in the American Academy, uh, black men are actually told that for them to even talk about their oppression means that they're taking on the position of patriarchy. So even though black men have worse outcomes than their white male counterparts, and in, in many cases, worse outcomes than their black female counterparts, they're being told that to talk about their oppression, to center themselves, is a patriarchal move in itself because they're black men. And this, this really does mean that we can't develop in black studies or within black gender theory or black feminism any kind of eye or empathy for the kinds of suffering that black men and boys actually go through. On the white supremacist side, white supremacists hate black men because black men are aggressive, they're angry, they're scary, they're militant. Much of the language that we have about the Black Panther Party being sexist, misogynistic, and militant doesn't actually come from any research done by black feminists. It comes from um, you know, Firestone's book um, on the dialectic and, uh, uh, on dialectics and sex from the 1970s, where she introduces this idea as a white feminist in the 1970s. So you have this mythological tradition where these where where Shelamita Firestone comes up and says, "Oh, these these radical black men are really trying to imitate white male patriarchy. They're really trying to just be white men." And this this just carries on as part of the kind of mythology that gets taken up in black feminism and black gender studies and even black studies itself. So until we go back and really understand why there's this this 
discouraging of, of black male radicalism, why there's this need for black men to remain silent when they're um, the majority of the victims of all kinds of heinous crimes. They have the lowest life expectancy, the greatest rates of downward mobility uh, in the United States um, is really concerning because it means that we can't facilitate or have discussions about the kinds of problems that black men and boys suffer in the United States so that we can actually get an eye towards solving and and in in the vein of the whole patriarchy, um, I, I know in other interviews, um, I've heard you say that in terms of where black men fit into the patriarchy, they are like these subgroups of men, if you will, like they are levels mm-hmm. to patriarchy. Can you talk a little bit about the different levels and where you, like based on your studies and the data itself, see black men fitting into mm-hmm. that schism? Because there are arguments and there are arguments that I know I've certainly had online about black men are not part of the patriarchy, like for the very reasons that you said, Absolutely. if you're the most injured party, you, you can't be put on par with, with your oppressors. Like that just logically makes no sense to me. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. I just published an article uh, on this history. So the history of patriarchy in the United States is really, is really particular and, and peculiar. So in the 1940s, white women were trying to figure out how they could separate themselves from patriarchy. So you have to remember, before 1940, the idea of patriarchy was very racial. And you can actually see proof of this in John Dollard's work, um, you know, uh, Class and Caste in a Southern Town, where he discusses the patriarchal caste as being the white race. So in the 1940s, the idea was that whites were the patriarchal race. They were the most civilized, they were the most manly. And this is why in the 19th century, for instance, you had white women claiming they were more masculine than even African Zulu warriors. Because the black race was a feminine race, even the most masculine and warrior-like black man is going to be more feminine and able to be dominated by the white race, even if it's by a white woman. So the notion of gender and patriarchy were fundamentally different in the 19th century going into the 20th. When we're having an argument about the modern concept of patriarchy, what we're really talking about is a debate between two or three authors, right? Between, mm. um, you know, people, you know, Simone de Beauvoir, for instance, um, you know, who's trying to show, show that sex operates in a very similar uh, caste-like system that race does, right? And what these authors were trying to show is that, well, look, when you start looking at how women are treated, you can look at women, the woman's place, very much alongside the Negro's place, right? So Alva Murdoch actually writes an essay, right, a, 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 a parallel problem to the Negro problem, where she's trying to make this, this, this relationship, this argument between how white women are treated and how the Negro is treated. I always find it interesting when people try to have this argument about patriarchy because they're saying, oh, it's about men's domination of women. But what they don't understand is that, well, the way that women started to understand themselves as being dominated wasn't by looking at the oppression that women suffered, right, in a white, in, in a male-dominated society. It was actually white women trying to make their position synonymous to how the Negro suffered in a white supremacist society. You, you, you can't so the very have, notion of patriarchy you that you're have, getting from Alva Murdoch <laughs> is based on black people. You you can't have that though and then be like have uh Virginia laws uh written into play in the in the um late 1800s allowing you to kill enslaved people. Like that's contradictory. No, absolutely. Absolutely. There there's no there's no male power, right? The the whole process of lynching, emasculation, castration, there is no racialized male that was safe from that, right? Most of most of the practices that you have about racism that we that we focus on uh, results in the castration and display of black male genitalia precisely to show the feminization and the rule of black male bodies by white men and white women and white children. Um, the black male stood below these figures, below these groups of people. Right. And this is important because the notions of patriarchy that we're utilizing today are largely the class-based notions that we're getting out of a feminism from 1970s. Is not the actual debates or it's not the kind of uh, historical genealogy about patriarchy where we're looking at how black people set the template for how white women were going to look at themselves as victims by by white men 
right? Black people, specifically black men, were the people who <clears throat> were the bodies that were situated and analyzed to come up with the idea of women's oppression. And these are very well-known debates. It's just that people don't want to recover them. So if you look at how patriarchy develops in any kind of racist or white supremacist society, racialized men are at the bottom, right? The social dominance theory talks about this, the work of Jim Sedanis and Felicia Prado. The idea is that if you're outside of the dominant racial group, those men are going to be understood as dangerous. So every single group, be they Asian men, black men, indigenous men, have been thought to be rapists and the destroyers of white civilization. If black men were patriarchs, if these other racialized men were patriarchs, surely they would have some kind of alliance with the dominant group men, with white men. That's never been the case. White men have always tried to exterminate other groups of racialized men. So to say that black men benefit from patriarchy in a white supremacist society completely overlooks the history, the economic position, and the, and the, just the basic or baseline demographics um, that these populations have within any, within any Western country. Dr. Curry, um, there was something I really wanted to get your thoughts on. Um, I, have bl I have three black Absolutely. daughters. My, my last daughter is three weeks old. Uh, I'm married to a black woman. My mom is black. Congratulations. And thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You know, so I'm all for a black girl magic, but I feel in today's mm -hmm. environment that black girl magic usually comes at the expense of black men. You know, I, I remember seeing during mm -hmm. uh, the uprisings last year, a lot of the protests in the name of Rihanna Taylor. There was a lot of scenes of people telling mm -hmm. black men, get behind these black women. Y'all don't speak up. These black women are leading. And so by your work, I've been able to look at the timelines and look at history and there's a passage that kind of got me locked into the man knot as soon as I started reading it. You have an excerpt mm. from uh, Sojourner Truth Speech where she, she essentially says that, yes. why are black men getting the right to vote? I would rather have these white women get the right to vote because they're more cultured, they're more gentle, these black men are beasts, and black women don't know anything. And then also you talked about like uh, black feminist work like Michelle Wallace, Black Macho, or I believe it's the Black Macho, mm -hmm where she made all these assertions Absolutely, yeah. about the aggressiveness and the violence of black men, but then later walked it back. But that's still used as, as uh, a foundational text when it comes to black feminism. So I see this, this past example, this, this kind of mid-range example in the 50s and 60s and 70s to today. Mm. We see this historical timeline continuing. Why, do we, why are we not getting it and getting out of it? Well, look, the, the negative stereotypes about black men are bolstered it across a wide range of disciplines and, and, and social media outlets and, and journalism. You know, the idea of the absentee black father, the idea of the black male super predator, the, the, the black boy who's a deviant. You know, these, these are all tropes that are, are bolstered by these kinds of gender analyses. The reason that you see the kind of patterns from Michelle Wallace to Bell Hooks, even as some of the work that I put out in a recent publication, um, Decolonizing the Intersection, that points out how Kimberly Crenshaw is relying on some of this culture, subculture violence uh, material and criminology, is that feminism started off in the 1800s as a backlash to black male emancipation. So the reason that you have Sojourner Truth saying things like, you know, if black men got the right to vote, it would be just as worse as before because black men lay around idle. They do nothing. And, you know, they take the money from their women is because Sojourner Truth is hanging out with white suffragists or suffragettes who believe the exact same thing. People like Elizabeth Caddy Stanton, uh, Phoebe Cousins. Right. This was the language that white suffragettes were using to discourage, you know, Congress from allowing black men the right to vote before civilized and educated white women. So throughout, from the beginning of feminism, from the 1860s forward, right, if you're, if you're, if you're linking feminism to suffragism, um, you're going to have negative depictions of black men. The stuff that's coming out from Michelle Wallace in the 1970s, from Bell Hooks in the 1980s, from Crenshaw in the, in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, are, are all going to be influenced by the types of debates that white feminists are having. And again, if you look at those debates, if you're looking at what people like Susan Brown Miller or um, Holmes and Williams are writing in the second assault about black men, the argument is that they're compensatory, they have no cultural notions of masculinity, and they're all rapists. So this is the dominant view that American feminism and gender studies has had of the black male. The stuff that you're seeing is just a reproduction of that. And no one wants to question it because in the academy to question feminism is to ultimately sign to, to, to sign, you know, your your death warrant in terms of your career. It's such a popular ideology that's linked to equality and egalitarianism that no one has the ability to even point out the racism of the movement. 
And that's despite books like Louise Newman's The Origin of White Women's Rights being out since 1999. Mm. And other other black feminists saying that, yeah, suffragists were racist, but they don't ever want to point out the specific history that you get from suffragism and its relationship to black men and boys. And what my work's trying to do is trying to expose this, trying to say we need to look more at how white feminism influenced some key black feminist tropes and theories, and how this has been utilized and popularized as the basis of interpreting black, interpreting black masculinity. Bell Hooks has no citations, but she's the most authoritative source on black masculinity in the United States. And it's despite the fact that you can literally pull verbatim from her book and subculture violence theory, um, like Farrah Cootie and Wolfgang in 1967. The idea is that black men are hypersexual, that they don't have a true masculinity, so they compensate by being uh, rapists and predators and criminals and gangsters. And this kind of trope of poverty of the poor black male is what defines masculinity for the group at large. Um, these are incredibly problematic and racist tropes that we've dispelled in criminology for over the last few decades. But nonetheless, they remain unquestioned and unchallenged under the rubric or the banner of black feminism. They seem to be uh, projections, in my opinion, but I'm not studied in this stuff. That's Absolutely. just, that's just Absolutely. my opinion. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the, um, the idea of the buck and the breaking of buck and, and sexualization of mm -hmm. uh, men and boys um, during slavery? It's not something we talk about. And I know I copied you uh, on a chain. Someone had done a, ch a chain on Twitter and it was like um, different comedians and different hip hop artists talking about uh, mm. their being sexualized so young. And again, when you have laws being written so that white women can not only um, kill for the correction of enslaved people, but they can mm. also sexualize those those people um, and, and then Definitely. that not be criminalized. I mean, you the in terms of white culture, white American culture, like it really did create its own fantastical experience, if you will, with black men. But it to me, like once mm -hmm. slavery ended, it became this other thing to compensate for their own, um, I don't know, sexuality, if you will. But people don't talk about that often. No. And yeah, look, I, I think there's an emerging field of research around the rape of black men and boys in the United States. Um, you know, the work of Thomas Foster, Lamont Adu, my work, of course. Um, you know, it's it's a problem because the academy wants to deny the sexual vulnerability of black men during slavery and Jim Crow. And I think that one of the reasons this happens is because once you start accepting that white men and white women were raping black men and black boys, it inverts the way that you want to see history. And it's important for white people to hold on to history in a certain way. Because while they could accept that white men raped black women, to accept that white men were also raping black men and boys adds a kind of homoeroticism uh, to the dynamics of anti-black racism that I think white society is uncomfortable with. I think what's even scarier is that once we get to the point where we're acknowledging that white women had the power to, write, to rape black men and boys, um, it completely throws off the notion of white womanhood. You know, one of the one of the... I guess harshest and most um, adamant pushbacks I get back in the in the academy is when I consider the role that white women have played in the manipulation, murder, and sexual exploitation of black males. And one of the first retorts is, well, black uh, white women are victims, right? White women were complacent within the the system of slavery and Jim Crow. But you know, I actually have an interview from a late survivor of Jim Crow, where he actually goes into great detail describing how he was raped by white women and how this system, how this problem um, not only created uh, issues for him throughout his life, but was part and parcel of, of a plantation slash uh, sharecropper system in Louisiana from the 1940s forward. And imagine that for a moment. If we accept that white women used to exploit black boys for sex. He, he used to talk about how on Saturdays they would come to the corner store and they would give black boys money to come do yard work. So under the pretense of work, they had these black boys come into their homes and they were raping them. And I, and I asked him, you know, in the interview, well, you know, if these white women were doing this, um, could you say no? And he, he said, if a white woman fell from the sky and told a black boy to pull his pants down, 
If he didn't do it, he'd be lynched as a rapist anyway. So we live in a, a society and a culture that tells us that the exploitation of black men from slavery and Jim Crow, even in our present day, doesn't happen despite the data and the testimonies that show that it does. And we have to ask ourselves very serious questions. What is the investment in the world that would call black men a rapist or black men rapists while denying that they are victims of rape? The data from the CDC is overwhelming. Black men report some of the highest 12 month prevalences of, of sexual violence of victimization in the United States. So that means that within 12, a 12 month prevalence, who gets who reports the highest victimization of contact sexual violence in the United States? Black men are one of the highest groups, if not the highest group in the country. Now, think about how much that works against the psyche, the consciousness that we have, the rhetoric that we have of Me Too, that in fact, black men are one of the most vulnerable sexual groups. Mm -hmm. It practically refutes and flies in the face of every sexual stereotype we have about black men and boys. So there's money, there's, there's, there's ideology, there's bureaucracy that protects the stereotypes that black men are sexual predators, while simultaneously trying to negate the fact that they're sexually vulnerable. And until we actually get a chance to push back against that, to recognize that this is not just a contemporary finding that we have in our world today, but this is a historical pattern that originated with black men and boys back in slavery through Jim Crow to our present day, we're not fully understanding the, the, the concept or the, the precarity uh, that black male life has. And I think this is what's important when we look at something like the buck. You can have the notion of the hypersexual black male, but in that notion of the buck, the question is, well, who is he having sex for? What is the buck meant to reproduce? What is his function in society? You could say that black men are hypersexual all day, but if black boys are having some of the earliest sexual experiences between the ages of 9 and 14 of any other race sex group in the United States, then what are you priming these young boys to be? What kind of victimization, what kind of trauma, what kind of pain do they suffer by having sex and being victim at the ages of 9, 10, 11, or 12 that you wouldn't find if these black boys were treated with full respect, humanity, and sexual dignity that we met demand for any other body in the United States. Well, Dr. Curry, to kind of stay in this same realm, I want to read another passage from Killing Boogeyman. And you said that the freedom of black men from slavery birth the rapist, while his attempts to live a social and economic life was met with lynching, death, and castration. The mutilation of his body was a spectacle that served to deter others from seeking freedom. His death was used as an indication of the health of white supremacy, its vitality and progress. And it was that last line that really stood out to me. His death mm. was used as an indication of the health of white supremacy, its vitality and progress. Can you just expand on that a little bit? Well, yeah, the, the death of black men has always marked the success of, of white supremacist societies in the order. Um, you know, think of it like this. Anytime you have a war or a battle or a conquest, you know, the real issue is how do you know that one group was victorious or the other? And it's usually through the number of dead bodies that one group's amassed over the other group. So the same way that in war you would see, you know, the, the corpses of, of men is the same way that in the United States we see the corpses of black men as a symbol uh, that white supremacy is healthy and vibrant. Uh, the ability to kill the black male savage has always been associated with power, virility, um, and patriarchy. Um, this is one of the purposes and, and functions of lynching, right? Um, to make the black male body uh, distorted, deformed, um, you know, androgynous, so to speak, with the cutting off of the castration uh, of the penis. So when we look at the death of black men and boys, we have to understand that that is a function or a sign of the masculine element within racialized patriarchies. And we see the same thing within genocides. We saw the same thing in the Holocaust. We saw the same thing in the Armenian genocide. Um, the murder of men is usually the first uh, step in the complete elimination of the whole group. So I think what happens in the United States is that we take such individualistic and such ideological frameworks to analyze problems that we don't see and recognize historical patterns of elimination uh, right before us. I think we would be hard pressed to find a genocide scholar that wouldn't look at the amounts or the numbers of black men that are incarcerated or killed by police or their low life expectancy as signs of genocide or at least some population level event. 
Um, but that doesn't resonate with how we study race in the United States because race has always been uh, a question or postulate of, of equality. Well, what what about our blackness prevents our equality rather than looking at blackness as an indication of disposability or a mark of dehumanization where it gives one free license to kill, eliminate, or dispose of black bodies any way they see fit. And unfortunately, the first black bodies are, that, that are um, are marked for disposal are going to be uh, black males. And this is a pattern that we see from antiquity to now. So when I say that the death of black men indicates the health, what is what I'm saying is the war that white supremacist societies have against the black population um, is made evident by the display of dead black male bodies. And to add on to that, I got into a conversation with someone on, on Twitter, I think two days ago, about the spoils of war. And you're saying that essentially black I would say the black family has been subject to genocide, but with the first uh, victims of that genocide being uh, black men, you know, in terms of our socialization, just as black women, it, mm -hmm. the, there has to be a concern. And, and more, a, lo a lot Absolutely. of times in, in our, our political advocacy and my political advocacy, you know, I make sure that I speak to the family unit because I think sometimes exactly mm -hmm. what you just stated, people miss that and, and missing that um, is, Absolutely. is, you know, that's how you um, re-engineer a society and you have, you know, the, the next version of a society once there's been a conquest mm -hmm. and, and, and we as women, as black women in particular, need to really understand and protect uh, black men as much as we can with whatever power that we have because we become the spoils of war. No one Absolutely. talks about that. Absolutely. Listen, well, but 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 because we don't we don't use conflict based frames or analysis to talk about racism. You're exactly right. Look, if you're looking at a genocide, I know that civilian men between the ages of 15 and 55 are going to be killed first, and they're going to start root and branch killings, meaning they're going to kill the women and they're going to kill the children. The reason you kill the men first is because those are the populations that resist. You kill the women and children because those are the populations that reproduce, right? So this is, you know, if I if I was a British colony, then I would do the same thing, except I would rape the women to, to produce mulatto children that I would educate in Britain and then have them come back to the colony and manage all the black folks, right? Like these, these are techniques of colonization and racism that we have have centuries and centuries of evidence for but again we're not deploying those analyses in terms of how we study race and racism because our focus on race and racism is generally about equality and more importantly how do we gain certain resources being the voices of black people more generally now the the black family is very interesting because not only most people look at the black family as some kind of you know decadent archetype some you know, call back to a past as patriarchal and a nuclear family and conservative. But that's not really the issue. The issue is, is that when you start looking at problems or issues of wealth and social mobility and, um, you know, political power, these things are analyzed in terms of families and households. And what happens to the black family is you have disproportionately high single mother households, you have disproportionately high black women who are underpaid, are working, are underemployed, working two part-time jobs. Uh, you have a system where poverty accumulates around around black people, neighborhoods, residences, et cetera, and that poverty breeds violence like you would in any other group. So there is no way that you can have notions of a thriving black family structure when you have racism saying that black people are inferior. You have a socioeconomic system that's constantly attacking the ability of the black family to, to mobilize throughout society and then you have the imposition of violence and, and political repression uh, not only attacking black men but also black women and black children so that they can't rise in society as well so when you ask what the what the health or the vitality of black people in the United States is, is then you have to ask yourself well what's the state of the households and the families mm. and I think that because we've become so intersectional that we forget that there are core elements of political economics and social mobility, um, the family just doesn't figure into many of the analyses that we have or that public intellectuals are willing to talk about because they think it throws us back to the, something like the Monaghan Report instead of looking at concrete data that's showing that households are extremely important for how we interpret economic positionality or even political power in the United States. Dr. Curry, before we uh, shift a little bit, I want to ask you about something regarding uh, the election that just passed. I was watching one of your lectures and it stood out to me that you said, well, before I go there, 
in the last election, there was this pervasive narrative of black women have saved the democracy and black men <laughs> worked to destroy it. Y'all's ninety four percent voting rate didn't yeah, count, despite the fact. <laughs> yeah, that I know. It doesn't count. Even the reported numbers, you know, we're voting at eighty percent, you know, but somehow yeah. we're destroying the democracy. But I saw in one of your lectures, you found that you actually disaggregated that data and found yeah. that Hispanic and non-Hispanic black men were lumped together. So can you just yes. talk about yeah. that a little bit? If if that is actually if that's there, if we know that's there, then why is this narrative persisting despite the fact that it's not true? Because the world hates black men. I mean, I don't. I mean, who knows why? Why this Absolutely. is stupid. I mean, yeah, the, the, they didn't disaggregate Hispanic and non-Hispanic black men. So, you know, the five three eight data. We we right. We wrote an article about it. We're actually going to publish an article about it in our philosophy conference pretty soon. Uh, you know, it's just looking at what happens when you disaggregate Hispanic black men from non-Hispanic black men, and we did a, a two by two table chi-square analysis. We found that there wasn't any significant risk. Our association with being a black man voting Republican versus you know not being a black man. So, you know, I think these narratives persist because, you know, we've 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 accepted as intuitive that women are more liberal than men. But what ends up happening is, is that when we try to plug that in in the black race, we can't explore some of the dynamics now. And, and I don't want to this isn't like a novel finding. I mean, people like Evan Simeon, Evelyn Simeon, uh, people like Catherine Hornoys, Catherine Blee, they've all done work on this issue where there's basically no gender gap in black voting patterns. We've just examined this within some of the you know preliminary data in the last election and found the exact same thing. But the question really is, is that how you have evidence from the last two or three decades that show that black men don't really differ with with black women in terms of political attitudes or voting behaviors but there's still this need this myth to create a caricature of black men who are overly conservative who are uh bent on you know the kind of charismatic white supremacists like trump and how who and 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 you have public commentators right uh public intellectuals that that are never asked to present any kind of data or evidence you know just proliferating the airways talking about how black men are patriarchs and why that's why they're voting for people like Trump. And as you said, when the final numbers came out, I mean, I think there was maybe a five or 6% differential yeah. between black men and black women. Um, you know, these things don't make sense. You know, it's, it's, it's where all available evidence, you know, and these people aren't doing any kind of real statistical analysis. They're just pulling, you know, percentage charts, you know, just baseline data and voting and trying to make a case. And the idea is that, well, because the percentage rates being reported for voting Democratic or voting for, you know, Biden um, and Harris were higher amongst black women, that black men somehow deserve no credit. And I always find that fascinating because they don't do that for any other group. Right. When people talk about women voting one way, they don't say, oh, well, only black or Latino women voted, or Latinas voted X, none of the other women matter. But somehow when we're talking about race, only black women's votes in every state matter. Black men's votes who are overwhelmingly democratic right. in these in these counties and these states don't matter. And I think it's another way for us not only to proliferate negative images and negative stereotypes of black male political attitudes and voter behavior, but it's also a way to erase black male political visibility, yep. right? The idea here is that black men don't have any political sensibilities that black women don't have, that they have no specific issues. I remember when it was the when it was the election and they were trying to explain why black men didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. The only argument given was sexism. Hmm. And, you know, I have a degree in political science. One of the first things we learn in political science is that you have people that vote vote based on party. Right. And you have people that vote based on issues. And one of the issues that black men had with Hillary Clinton is her association to the prison industrial complex. That is so it's not her. surprising that if in the election, if some black men turned away from Clinton as a viable candidate, it could possibly have nothing to do with sexism and everything to do with the idea she thinks black men are super predators and was part of the expansion of the prison industrial complex. But we don't give black men that kind of sensitivity. We give white supremacists more issue-based analysis in elections than we do black men who are working class or middle class. Now, for black men, the answer is always sexism. And it, 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 what it shows is a very, very dangerous kind of paradox of how we think about black male intellectualization in this country. We will suggest that every other voting bloc, no matter how uneducated, no matter how poor, no matter how socioeconomically deprived, have some position and right to vote. When you talk about black men and boys, the idea is that we don't need to analyze their voting behaviors, we don't need to understand their issues, and we certainly don't need to look at their issues. We just say that if they voted for the Democratic pro, pro, uh, pro, you know, 
candidate. They're being progressive and they're following black women who are saving the day. And if they don't, they're being patriarchal, misogynistic. Those are the only two axes that we're allowed to understand black men and boys in this country. And both of them are deaf to base. Either they do what their women are doing or they do uh, what white men are doing. Nobody asks what is the asks what does the black male vote look like? What does hmm. the black male vote hope to attain? And this is a terrible dereliction of, of our duty as, as, as black intellectuals, as scholars, and even as uh, policy and opinion makers. Because it's saying that we just don't give a damn about this population. And when this population deals with some of the most atrocious negative demographic markers in this country, like low life expectancy, unemployment, downward mobility, incarceration, et cetera, why are we not looking at this oppressed and marginalized group for answers? Isn't the one of the lessons of feminism that the people who suffer the most are in the best position to tell you about the oppression? Right. But even though black men suffer two, three, four fold than their female counterpart, they have nothing to say to the country, much less the world, about how white supremacy racism and sex-based discrimination and violence work these things these things are nonsensical so these ideologies these tropes these media you know facades and celebrations exist largely because there's an investment in the narrative of, of, of black male deficit and deviance and until we start addressing that there's real money that's being put forth by democratic and republican platforms and conventions that try to demonize erase or marginalize black male voices we're never going to see any kind of accountability uh to populations that are desperately in need of not only political voice but but the access of the of political programs and policy demand not you said you wrote this book from a 21st century in which black men and boys are still being lynched in america um i write mm -hmm. to you from a world where an innocent black man can be deprived of decades from his life and convicted of rape because his face came to a woman in a dream as her rapist. This is the pre precariousness that has come to define what black men and boys endure in life. I write this book to give voice to the black male coerced into silence, his experiences denied within disciplines and his realities refused by theory. Yes, ma'am. Those are some powerful words. Um, Makes many... it sound like I knew what I was saying. <laughs> I think you did. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, you've talked about the traumas and, and you know, the, this life at times um, for black people and for black men in particular is a traumatic life. It's one that has multi-generational traumas. And um, because black men are often silenced, you know, how do you manage and you um, and you get to to sort of come forth. And so through through the man not, I mean, you wrote and you're, you're speaking to men. Um, we know that the book certainly resonates um, with men, um, mm -hmm. particularly we do political work and the men in our political circles, they are very familiar with your work. But um, fantastic. talk about, you know, the multi-generational traumas and, and how can we get uh, our men to, to, to almost I want to say be vulnerable enough to open up and to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I think to the extent that some of these artists and entertainers are talking about it, I think that's a good thing. Um, but Absolutely. there has to be a way for us to like create space, if, if nowhere else other than within our own black culture, um, for these men to have these safe spaces. So if you could just give us some advice on, on what you think we can or should do um, to, to, to move this needle somewhere. Yeah. Look, I gotta, I gotta tell you something. You know, I, I, I wrote that book because I come from a place where I didn't get to meet or see a lot of older black men. You know, I'm from Lake Charles, Louisiana, so most black men worked themselves to death um, before they became old. Like, you know, I don't think I saw a black man that was 70 years old until I was in my 30s or maybe my um, in my 40s. No, so definitely my 30s. You know, um, it's when, you, when you're raised in the South amongst poverty and you see black men working in kitchens, never being managers, you know, some of them used to have to work on the docks, you know, loading, loading the ship. Um, it creates a different sensibility and compassion to what black men go through to try to support their families and themselves. So when I, when I hear conversations about black male vulnerability, you know, how black men can feel safe, you know, expressing what they feel. I always ask myself, are people really able to hear their pain? And what I mean by that is we all have 
idealistic notions about what the world is and the opportunities that it affords us. And when black men fail in some cases, because there are a lot of successful black men, but when black men fail in some cases um, to succeed, what what does our mind jump to? Does our mind jump to a world that is systematically organized and oriented around the failure of black men, meaning that there are specific obstacles by employers, by educators, by criminal justice institutions and agencies to target black men and boys more so than whites and their female counterpart? Do we have explanations for black male failure or non-success that attribute that to the system? Or do we blame the black male or the black, the young black boy? And the reason that's important is because if we're trying to create spaces for black men to express themselves, those spaces can't be pathological. If we see black men who struggle with intimacy, or we see black men who struggle with, with pain or connection, are we asking what happened to that black man or we're saying that that's a bad black man? And I think that activists and as well as intellectual spaces have to reorient themselves around the notion of vulnerability. Vulnerability, and I and I, I saw this with Terry Crews, you know, vulnerability doesn't mean pick a black man and make him the token Negro for the day. So, you know, Cruz came out and said, oh, well, black men, if you were sexually vo- victimized, you need to say it now. When black men didn't share the story, he ridiculed them. That's not a safe space. What you have to understand is most of the work you're going to do with black men and boys, especially around issues of sexual violence, Many of these black men and boys don't even recognize they were victims of sexual violence. Yeah. So what in our studies we had to say, well, if this happened to a young girl, would you call it rape? Would you? And they'll say yes. But did this happen to you? Yes. So why do you not call it that? Well, we don't know, right? You know, these are the kinds of questions that you have to use to to engage black men because the world has taught them that they don't matter, that they don't have voice, that they can't be victimized in certain ways. You know, I say all the time that the world teaches black men that the only way they could be hurt is by is 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 from a bullet. That it doesn't consider the kind of cyclical and cultural violence that black men and boys experience in the United States. So if you want to hear these voices and pull these voices out, you first have to extend an olive branch that's going to draw out the ability of black men to see themselves as victims. Because so much of the world, so much of the work, so much of the theory that's produced in the academy absolutely denies that black men are victimized by things like child sexual and physical abuse, or, or rape, or domestic violence, you know, or, 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 or my Aggressions, our racial battle fatigue, et cetera. You know, that's one of the reasons I really appreciate William A. Smith's work. So we, so these spaces need to be created with a focus on what we haven't captured yet about black male experience, and then trying to create a venue where black men can fill that in. The second thing we have to do is we have to open up the conversation about a tra- uh, about trauma and sexual abuse of most black men and boys. A lot of the arguments, a lot of the vulnerabilities about black men happen in intimate spaces and family spaces, but we're not seeing black men and boys as being victims of, of, of family uh, of violence. And that has to change. You know, one of the first uh, experiences that young black men have, both of disappointment and violence and, and, and sexuality, um, comes in some form of family or community. So these have to become more open conversations and topics for discussions, uh, especially for, for black men. And the last thing I would say is uh, peer focus groups. Uh, mm. the, the evidence is pretty overwhelming at this point that black men respond better to issues of depression, um, anxiety, and other mental health issues um, through through peer focus groups, talking to each other, right, having the sense of community, uh, much more more so than any kind of clinical treatments or, or even uh, the way that we think of kind of the woke divism that we see today. I think that these are specifically tailored ways or forms that black men could thrive and actually begin to do some of the work of healing from the kinds of violence and the kinds of suffering that they experience in their daily lives in their own communities and households. Thank well, you for that. Well, Dr. Curry, you know, we're getting short on time. And so I wanted to ask you about this subject real quick. I want to ask you about Black Lives Matter. And just from, <laughs> from my own uh, stance, I've kind of been. Are you off sure the, you want to go there? We can go there. <laughs> we can go there. <laughs> okay. You know, okay. So, I'm just asking if it's a safe space. Oh yeah, it's safe. You know, you know, I've been off the <laughs> Black Lives Matter bandwagon for quite some time, almost from the beginning, and that was because, mm-hmm. and my wife told me to keep my mouth shut, you know, because I was called all types of names because I just wasn't a supporter, and that was because I went on their mm-hmm. site, I saw their mission statement, and there was no mention of black men, no mention of black boys, mm-hmm. and really. A, a drive to move away just from uh, uh, regular family structures or traditional family structures. Mm-hmm. And so, like I said, I was called all types of names for that. But then we see today 
we have mothers like Tamir Rice's mother and other mothers who are victims, uh, or their children are victims of police violence, now coming out mm-hmm. saying that Black Lives Matter used them for paydays. And I just want to get your thoughts yeah, on that. How yeah. do you feel about that? Yeah, I think Breonna Taylor's mother just came out recently as well, didn't mm-hmm. she? For in in uh, Kentucky, yes, she did. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, listen, I wasn't, I didn't support Black Lives Matter from the beginning because they excluded poor people. You know, I, you know, I think as academics, there's a lot of pressure to fall in line. There's kind of this mob mentality. And I think that when Black Lives Matter started, the idea was that every black person, every black scholar had to fall in line. Right. It was a popular movement. It was being supported by the Democratic Party. So that's, you know, people were publishing books and it was a quick fix, you know, places like Oxford and, you know, all the big presses wanted to publish books on Black Lives Matter because it was popular. And, you know, you know, it was it was it was a, a way to get a reputable press to, to look at some black issues. The problem was that none of these books were critical. Right? All these books were were, you know, celebrating BLM. They're celebrating that it was. Uh, intersectional movement or celebrating that was black female leadership and none of them asked the very basic questions that you would ask of any political party does the leadership of blm or the blm organization accurately represent the issues and concerns of the population it claims to represent which are poor working class black people who are victims of police violence the answer is no does blm actually try to ameliorate or deal with any of the issues that affect the majority of the population it claims to represent which would be poor black men who are overwhelmingly killed by police the answer is no but does it center some marginalized voices from black queer and trans bodies the answer there is yes and if that's what you support as part of your liberal democratic agenda, then you think that BLM is a success. If you look at the people who are the majority of the victims, which are poor working class black men and women, um, then the answer is overwhelmingly no. And I was on the side of no, because I wanted to understand how do you get the corporatization and the proliferation of BLM messages where people like DeRay um, was 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 giving I mean for a while he was I think he was putting up McDonald's sponsors you know on his on his Twitter page as them supporting the movement you know the, this is big corporatist endorsement and sponsorship this does not help poor black people who are dying so what you had was an incentive structure that I think people are becoming more comfortable talking about now right that that says that look we've hand selected or hand picked these black women to be the leaders or the face of a movement even though they don't help black men who are the majority of the people being killed but let's give them deals with cadillac warner brothers let's buy million dollar homes yep. so what you've seen and this is what you see for the first time in history are black political leaders right in the middle of a civil rights movement where people are being shot and killed becoming rich off of the blood and the deaths of the people they claim to represent now remember this is a this reality that we're now deciding to talk about i wrote an article about this a year and a half ago but this reality that we're just deciding to talk about now which is this kind of capitalist and corporate structure of blm that exports poor black people specifically poor dead black men um is in contrast to the civil rights movement that we're taught we should reject because black men led it so think about it in the 1960s and 70s the idea was that black power sclc and the other civil rights movements were patriarchal Right. And what what we mean by that is the black men pursued civil rights leadership and, and, and initiatives because they wanted power like white men. Most all these black men were practically dead. Malcolm X was shot. King was shot. Megger Evers was shot. All the Black Panthers were in exile or killed. So their reward for trying to allegedly be patriarchs was death. In this world, right in the 21st century, the intersectional kind of leadership is rewarded with multi-million dollar contracts, mm. homes in exclusive white neighborhoods, and endorsement from corporate sponsors like McDonald's, Cadillac, etc. So if we're actually analyzing questions of power, how is it that you have a movement that's supposed to be anti-state, anti-establishment, and nonviolent arguing for peace and taking on the voices and the and the issues that poor black people, poor black men specifically suffer, becoming richer, where the people who fought for the liberation, destruction, the segregation, hmm. the police that all ended up dead. You see, this is and this is what I mean when I talk about the lack of critical thinking and the dominance of ideology. You call BLM an intersectional movement, so the idea is that it automatically is successful. But we haven't seen any decrease of black male death over right. the last, you know, five or six years. The data goes back to 2013 or 2015. I think if you look at the fatal force data from Washington Post, six, seven years, you haven't seen a decrease of black male death in the United States. So how then is the movement a success? You've seen people become richer, but none of those people are even black men. 
right? And even right. if you look at DeRay, DeRay's not giving you a radical message. DeRay's not working with, you know, poor populations. There's not a celebration of DeRay with, by, by poor black people in Ferguson, et cetera, still dealing with police violence. So the poor black people that are actually enduring the violence, the murder, the hatred that white supremacist societies are imposing on them are completely erased. And then white liberals are celebrating these 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 caricatures of, of, of black life because these are palatable representations of what black men and women could be. And you ask a very simple question. If you empathize with the black struggle, why do you need the Cadillac Warner Brothers version of the black struggle instead of the black people who are, in fact, the wretched of the earth, suffering, dying in, in, in the poorest and most policed and, and deprived areas of the United States? You see, the reality of the situation is the people that we're saying represent us in BLM wouldn't dare step foot in many of the places and neighborhoods that they claim they, they, they represent. represent. Yep. And that yeah. is a problem because it shows that there's not effective governance of the organization such that it actually represents the interest and in the, in the agendas of the people that it claims that it's trying to save. So white people are now suddenly endorsing middle class or socially mobile black folks that are tokens for their agendas rather than the black people who we see every day dying. Why is it that there are no black men from working class neighborhoods in the southern you know, United States that are put on the forefront of what these agendas are? Right. What are the criticisms, the debates about BLM and whether or not it's actually representing poor black people, specifically black men? Why is there not a discussion about the specific risks of black men and boys to police killings when they're 96, 97 percent of the victims? These are all failures of the ideology, the structure and the analysis of BLM. But overwhelmingly, if you look at black academics, there's a celebration of the movement because it's feminist, intersexual and led by black queer women women so that anybody who disagrees with blm its message or it's or the way it's been doing its job are automatically labeled misogynist sexist etc 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 that's so, right we, that's we a found carry. ways to avoid debate rather than engage the seriousness of black life within these kinds of political organizations that are not doing their job dr curry before i pass the friday because we got to wrap it up i just want to say you know you're one of the black men i look up to most uh the man oh, not you, should be required reading for all black men because it allows you to kind of get this life that kind of beats you up and you don't really don't have an understanding of why it beats you up. And so I just wanted to say thank you for that. And I want to pass it to Friday so she can wrap us up. Yeah. Here. So we, I mean, you have given us like a, a wide range of things to think about and thought. Um, we would love to have you back again um, because I Absolutely. think that this, this is an ongoing conversation. And as we move to, to build up um, black men and the black family, um, particularly through our political efforts, I think that you are like a go-to person um, when we try to sort of work some of the, these mental exercises out and we work out what's happening with current governance. Um, mm -hmm. Where can people find you? I know where to find you on Twitter, but if you could give your social media <laughs> so people <laughs> can keep up with Absolutely. you. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, so you can give me on Twitter uh, at DRTJC. Uh, it gets a little wild on there sometimes, so, uh, you know, you can't be for the fate of heart. Uh, <laughs> I don't I don't understand Twitter. These people are just angry. They don't, they don't eat their Wheaties in the morning. They need a hug. Um, or, or you can catch me on, on Facebook, uh, Tommy, Dr. Tommy J. Curry. Um, you know, I, I have a professional page up there, so I'm, I'm pretty active on social media. Thank you so much for your time. I know Edinburgh, I don't know what the what the time difference is, but I know it's a big one. So thank you so much for making absolutely. time for yeah, us. Absolutely. No thank you, sir. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, for our listening no, thank audience, you for thank you. Thank you, sir. For our listening audience, we are going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to come back with Slauson Girl. Uh, she gives us news from uh, South L.A., and we're going to talk about some of the elections coming up.
shit. All right, so we are back from commercial break, and yes, we talk on our breaks. You caught us. <laughs> um, in a event, uh, the second part of our show today is featuring Slauson girl Miss Tina Sampe. Uh, Tina is a, a freelance journalist and writer from South Central Los Angeles. She provides world news with a South Central state of mind in her news and informational <laughs> podcast. So if you could please welcome uh, Slauson girl. Hey. Welcome, welcome. All right, so we are back from... I think you're on mute. Yeah, you're muted. Okay, so we're going to work out that technical difficulty. But I was told I didn't introduce Mr. Marcus Champion uh, properly, and I just want you guys to know as, as we uh, move forward with HR40, uh, Marcus Champion is one of the people with AB3121 who actually added language to that reparations bill. Uh, and the work that he did uh, has really... Um, been instrumental in how the bill moves forward, not only how it moves forward, but how it keeps the federal reparations movement at the forefront. So I want to give Mr. Marcus Champion his flowers, and I want to give the Champion family a quick shout out with baby Zuri in the mix with us. Um, girl dad, Mr. Marcus Champion. Girl dad, 100%. 100%. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess we're still working out tech difficulties. Um, do we you know. have do we, do we have Tina? There she is. Ready to go. Okay, welcome, welcome to our show. How are you? I'm well. Thank you guys for having me today. I don't know how the video is on. on you this. are crystal yeah, clear. Great. Okay, great. We hear and see you. All right, good. <laughs> so yeah, thanks again for having me. I really do appreciate your time and your platform. And um, yeah, thanks again. Yeah, so uh, Compton apparently is is what is what one of the things that you wanted to talk about in terms of South LA and that um, election. I know in that election, uh, the mayor of Compton she is stepping down. I think she's been in three terms. Does that sound um, right? This would have been her third term. She's done two so far. She's done two terms. She's not um, going up for reelection. And so tell us a little bit about what's going on with the Compton uh, mayoral election. Yeah, so Compton is in an elect in, in currently in an election right now. And um, it's a pretty big election because you have the mayor's seat open as well as a few seats for city council and some other positions. And so you know, Miss A Miss Asia Brown has been the you know most visible mayor of Compton that we've had for the last eight years, and so with her leaving her seat, it's going to be you know a change in leadership, and so I would just want to advise the people to just keep up with what is happening in Compton. What are some of the issues that you know are, are in addition to, you know, her, um, that being a major change and a major shift, what are some of the pressing issues um, happening in Compton? Because Compton has been sort of on the, on the come up, on the spin up for the past um, few years, obviously under um, Mayor Brown's leadership. Um, so what are some of the things that you really want people to be considering issue wise with this particular election? Well, a, a change in the hands of leadership potentially, you know, directs which way the city will move. And so just keep up with the people that are going to be in these positions to hold them accountable and to just keep up with the progress and the direction of Compton. In terms of issues specifically affecting Compton, that come to mind first besides all the potholes <laughs> that's something that i know people always mention when they think of compton but um definitely the um situation with compton's sheriff's department and the issue of gangs within the compton sheriff department and just um the outgoing attorney general did announce that there is going to be an investigation into the Compton Sheriff's Station. So people, you know, just keep up with that. Tina, uh, just to jump in real quick, uh, my wife's from Compton. Shout out to my wife, Natalie. 
Uh, we used to live in Compton, so I know exactly what you're talking about with the potholes driving down Rosecrans. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> but okay. um, it seems like Compton is shifting away from it, it, it isn't necessarily a majority black city, but black people still ran the local government. And so it right. seems like that shift is moving away. Uh, what do you think about that? Is there anything we can do to try to stem that tide? <laughs> well, stemming the tide would be um, keeping up with the popula population. And when you talk about changing demographics in Compton, of course, you know, we're talking about our Latino brothers and sisters. When it comes to the demographics and population, when you compare Black and Latino, Black people just, we're just not there in L.A., you know? So to stem that tide would be babies, in my opinion. In terms of changing um, local leadership in Compton, as you mentioned, you know, Compton for a long time has been ran by Black people. Um, I have no problem with a change in leadership. I have no problem with the race of the person. If we're going to be able to address the issues for everyone. And I know that that is easier said than done because it seems that black people have a very hard time at, you know, focusing solely on our community. So, we feel that with other people in office, our issues won't be addressed. Um, I say that black people, our push for liberation, rights, justice in this country has been the blueprint for other communities to get a foot in this country. And I think that no matter the race of the person, we should hold them all accountable into the fire. And I think that in LA, Black people have been let down by black leadership. That, that. I'm not speaking about Ms. Mayor, uh, Ms. Asia Brown, specifically in LA County, um, in the city of Los Angeles, I mean, I think that black people have been let down by black leadership. So I have no issue with the Latino candidate, Asian candidate, if we can press them for accountability, I'm sorry. Absolutely, don't be nervous, don't be scared. <laughs> we have a fun audience. Um, you know, let's switch gears from Compton and talk a little bit about the 54th race um, with uh, Sydney Kamlager in Los Angeles um, winning her uh, state Senate race. Uh, that seat has opened up. We have, uh, I think her last name is Hutt, Hutt, Miss Hutt, coming out of, uh, what is the v our VP's name? Um, coming out of- uh, Kamala Harris. Coming out of Kamala Harris's camp. Um, she's running. We have uh, Isaac um, Isaac Bryant Isaac Bryant uh, from the UCLA Bunch Center, who he is running. We have Dallas Fowler. Um, Dallas Fowler is a local darling. She is running. Um, what are your thoughts about that particular race in the fifty in the fifty fourth? Well, again, because I have been spending a lot of time focusing on Compton's current elections, I wouldn't say that I have had actually the time, much time, as I would like to, you know, kind of see what these candidates are about. I will say that I have um, seen their profiles. Um, someone that I actually have had interaction with um, is Mrs. Fowler, Ms. Dallas Fowler. Um, and so I feel that, you know, just from her energy, I feel that, you know, she probably definitely um, is a good candidate. They're all good candidates. They're, they're all good um, candidates. They definitely are. Of, you know, who I would specifically, you know, like choose, you know, I can't say per se. I would like some feminine energy. Um, again, I've had interactions with Ms. Fowler, but I don't have any, like, endorsements. As a journalist, I, I, I walk a very fine line of presenting information. So I just, um, as a journalist, I try not to endorse candidates, but um, I am going to be sharing some of Mrs. Fowler's, um, her, her campaign. So that's okay. all I can say about that. Great. All I can say is I got three different brochures and I'm not going to name any names, but one one brochure show, showed a lot of proximity to somebody. And I'm like, that's not enough to catch a vote. 
uh, and the other two, you know, showed things that they were about. I'm not saying the third one didn't, but I'm just saying it showed a lot of proximity pictures, and I'm not interested in one proximity picture is enough, but when your brochure has multiple proximity pictures, I, I have an issue with that. But that's just me and my uh, two cents. Um, in any okay. event, um, food desert, homelessness, any other subject that you might want to bring to the table that is really... Um, Pressing, and you want uh, folks to know about in South LA? Yeah, for our, for our audience, what what do you feel is is most important for especially the residents here in LA? What should we be paying attention to besides the electoral races? <laughs> what do you think it is that we should be paying attention to? Well, I actually have pages here of things. You know, um, it's really hard to narrow it down. You know take, what I'm take saying? Take two or three but, and tell <laughs> us about them. Take two or three. <laughs> okay, so. Definitely um, one of the most pressing recent issues is the Ralph's closure. Yeah, on on Crenshaw and Slauson. Yep. Yep. Right. Um, There's actually several closures that is happening of these um, Ralph's as well as Food for Less, which is under the ownership of Kroger. And so... I think that uh, we should be like boycotting Kroger. Like we shouldn't like something's going on there where they don't want to. They don't feel like their employees that have helped sustain their business during a global pandemic is worth an extra four to five dollars for you know 120 days. I think that's just that's very you know uh, just you know it's it's corporate America. So we understand maximizing profits, but you're not going to do that on the backs of vulnerable communities, especially during a global pandemic. So um, I know there has been a GoFundMe set up for some of the people who might be affected by this closure by a young student community organizer. Um, But they are supposed to be relocating some of these workers, but it's pretty much kind of up in the air because the, I won't say up in the air because I'm not there. I don't know what kind of information the workers have received since the protests and things like that. I know that a concern was those that were not a part of the union, would they be able to Mm. be, you know, placed and things like that. So I'm going to piggyback on, on that particular issue because LA is not immune to, um, supporting what I would call um, grocery store workers because we had that, was it Albertsons, I think, that went on strike some time ago and then the employees wanted us to to not shop at uh, Albertsons. And I think um, with Kroger, Kroger has made money hand over foot. Like through this pandemic, they literally have made money hand over foot. And as much as I love uh, Ralph's, because I, I, I'm i in the neighborhood, so I don't shop at that one. I shop at the one further up on a ro- Rodeo. Um, as much as I love Ralph's and as, as great as that store is, this is something that locally we can take into our own hands. Um, just like we made the shift during the Albertson strike to support uh, those workers and to not cross the lines, this is a time where we might need to be at Food for Less. We might need to be at Albertsons um, and at some of the other, sh- you know, shopping, some of our local grocers, some of our smaller stores. Um, you know, instead of running to the supermarket, run to your local grocer and give them some of your dollars. This is something that locally and communally that we can actually um, hop into and, and, and you know, take care of and well, so and it's a twofold concern because not only are we supporting the workers with that but what Ralph's needs to understand is that store needs they need to understand that store needs to stay open because that grocery store is the only large grocery store within a few mile radius like five six mile radius so you're creating a gap in terms of the availability of fresh foods you know we, it, it creates another food desert so to speak so you know, that's a very important issue that we need to pay attention to. A food to. desert while while Crenshaw is being gentrified, but that's a whole other conversation. Yep. What's number what's number two on your list there? Tina? Um, and well, the next another thing that I would like to mention that I don't feel has a lot any resolve is the fact that black people in LA represent thirty four percent of the homeless population but we're only 8% of the population in general in LA. Um, The Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority, which is like LA's governing department over homelessness, released a report in 2019 Mm -hmm. 
um, saying that institutional racism and discrimination was aiding in these disproportionate rates of black people being homeless in LA. Okay. Like I could see that without a report. What is the plan? The thing for me is that the obvious is being stated, but I don't see any plans. I don't see really any implement, any implementation of plans targeting this, uh, this issue. And I'm really concerned because I feel that LA's already did a number on the black community. Okay. When we talk about just, you know, the crack epidemic, the, uh, the, just the discrimination from when we moved over here from, you know, the, the South to the North and just, all of that, those politics, some families, the majority of families were able to have some upward mobility, but I feel like a large portion of Black LA has been severely affected for generations. And um, when we see these homeless rates today, I feel like some of that has to do with already the history that um, has happened to Black people in LA. And so I'm really concerned. I don't really see any any plans by the city for this, even though they have this report. And I, I don't, I feel like I want more people to be focusing on that, especially our city council people, um, especially the people that are actually even running for the 54th assembly race. Yeah, we can um, definitely second that motion um, with the homeless situation here. I know um, losing ACA five, which was to, to reverse proposition 209, and the effects of that, there was some hope from the mayor's office that with that legislation winning, even though it did not, um, that there would be things that could be done uh, specifically with targeting. But I know the Lasso report that you're uh, speaking about, and that is one of the few uh, city-issued reports that specifically said that the city's going to have to do race-based policy. There's no way to undo this and just speak in terms of services being a general thing. There's going to have to be a concentrated effort um, to actually, right. you know, target the, the community that is being so severely impacted, which disproportionately happens to be our community. Um, so we second that motion. And, and while we have the platform here, I will say to some of our Asian uh, legislators uh, at the state level who, who rallied uh, segments, I don't want to make blanket statements, segments of the Asian community to go against ACA5, um, this particular homeless issue is something where this state legislature is, is really going to have to do some sort of race-based policy, whether you want to or not. You, we don't have in the Asian community, um, you know, being 6% of the population and then 40% of homelessness. That's not, that's right. not an issue. But as our state legislators, we're definitely going to make the demand on some of the uh, conservative legislators uh, Asian legislators in particular who were against ACA 5 because as a community, we cannot afford for our people to ultimately just be displaced and lost due to homelessness. So we're going to give you one more thing and then we are going to wrap up this segment and our time with you as we're counting down here. Okay, definitely. Um, well, I hope you don't mind. I'll try to squeeze in two really important things. <laughs> squeeze them in. Very quick, very quick. And if you guys would like more information, you know, uh, you can tell them where to, you know, keep up with that. But I think also we should be keeping up with what's happening in the district attorney's office. Yes. Um, you know, Jackie Lacey is out. We have this new progressive district attorney, former district attorney from San Francisco, George Gascon, who, you know, the first day he was in office began, you know, implementing these um, reforms and, you know, uh, he did, he has done a lot actually, uh, you know, to re, you know, to really get into it would take a lot of time, but, you know, doing away with like the death penalty and not charging, you know, the youth as adults and also trying to do away with the sentencing enhancements that is giving, you know, these mm -hmm. excessive sentencing, you know, a lot of the stuff that, um, from the 80s and the 90s, you know. And so that's that's really good, but he has been getting a lot of pushback and I just want people to keep up with that. You know, he's been actually sued um, from, you know, people within his own department and just a lot of pushback from police unions and things like that, which is expected, you know, but he's also been getting pushback from families of victims in LA County who feel like Gascon sentencing reforms is not going to basically provide the, uh, 
appropriate sensing, sentencing for crimes that have been committed against their families. So it's a very interesting dynamic and I want people to keep aware with that. And then I would just like to squeeze this last thing in, which is just about the policing in LA and just how the ways that they continue to see black women and girls and the ways in which they have um, just continue to tell us that our, our you know, lives and our bodies just do not matter to them, but we know that they matter for sure. And so I just wanna uplift the name of Mikeyana Johnson. She is a mother of two from the community in LA, South Central South LA. She went missing in September, 2020 mm -hmm. at the height of the coronavirus pandemic. And a week later, her body was found um, on 96 and Gramercy by an elementary school. And despite the police giving her family no information about what has happened to her, they have closed her case. Um, and so that's just a huge issue. So, you know, and, and this is how the police in LA view black women and girls, and this is unacceptable. Her family had a visual yesterday. They have set up a foundation, the Mikeyana Johnson Foundation. So please follow that if anyone has any information. Her family is accepting anonymous tips. So I would just like to uplift the name of Mikeyana Johnson and thank you. Thank you for that. And if you could give me, if you could give me um, the the GoFundMe for, um, you spoke of a GoFundMe for the Rouse workers. And if you could give us um, whatever contact information for this young woman uh, whose family is looking for information, we will get that out on social media. Um, so okay. if you share that with us, we will share that information out. Um, thank you so much for coming through. Um, mm -hmm we we want to make sure that people can get in touch with you i follow you on social media um but i want to make sure that people are able to get in touch with you so if you could give your social media handles for um twitter and instagram that would be great okay definitely yeah thank you so you can find me online at slauson girl um dot com that's my website <laughs> and uh slauson girl instagram and um yeah, I am a journalist and I that's the work that I do. And so if you would like to know what's going on in LA from a black millennial female perspective, not corporatized, anything like that, tap in. And thank you so much for the time. I really do appreciate it. Absolutely. 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 Keep doing that good work. Yep. Thank you. Likewise. Also, one last thing, if I can mention. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you so much. So me and a friend of mine, Ms. Tar Perry, we actually are going to be um, creating a new podcast. We're going to be recording our first episode this week, and it's going to be called Black Brief LA. And it's just to, you know, just like this platform, offer more Black voices to the LA landscape, talking about politics, letting these people know that we are, we are in tuned and we're concerned and that we also have the ability to have these conversations. So um, yeah, be on the lookout for that as well. And thank you so much, Black Brief, Absolutely. Uh, Black Absolutely. Brief LA. All righty, thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much, much Sloss and yeah. Girl. Um, so that is our show today. We want show. to thank you for another one, as they say in Hollywood, is in the can. Um, we wanna thank our guests, um, Dr. Curry and Sloss and Girl. Um, for being here with us today. As you know, our show is, is now monthly, so this is the April show, and then we will be back next month in May. I want to thank uh, the wonderful Marcus Champion for holding uh, the, the, the seat down here for us and, and um, stepping up to, to, to help get this interview with Dr. Curry. He was very instrumental, so I'll give him some more flowers. Um, for all of our moderators, thank you. We are NAASD uh, Los Angeles. Politics and Black is the show. Uh, we will see you all next month. Thank you so much for tuning see in. See y'all next month. I'll be back in the back of the house next month. So I'll see y'all when I see y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Our voices, our views, this is Politics in Black.